So um, my name is Kailima. I'm a general pediatrician at the Evelina, um, and I'm also the clinical director for Evelina Medicine, um, which basically puts me in the bucket of being a medical manager, which is a slightly complicated um, title. And what I thought I'd do is spend a little bit of time talking about um, how and why I do what I do, and then we could see if we can pull some lessons from that, and then people feel free to ask me questions. The only problem with me not being able to um, control the slides is I'm going to have to say our next slide, so please may we have the next slide. Sure. Perfect. Um, so, you may well look at a man on the moon and ask what on earth has that got to do with um, paediatrics. So way, way back in the midst of time, it's probably about nearly 20 years ago, I was an SHO at um, the Evelina. And I distinctly remember being in the old NICU. So anyone who's worked in NICU more recently, it wasn't at St. Thomas's in its lovely new environment. It was at Guy's over two floors. Um, in fact, three if you counted uh, the maternity floor. Um, and I remember one night trying to prescribe um, potassium for a neonate. And every time I started doing the calculation on the back of an envelope um, for how much potassium is needed and how to dilute it, um, I would get interrupted. And I remember sitting there thinking, if we can put a man on the moon, why is it that I am still doing this with a piece of paper and a pencil um, rather than having it automated? And one thing led to another. I read an article on the BMJ, which was about this stuff that I didn't really understand or know anything about patient safety and medication safety and that sort of piqued my interest given those thoughts I'd had and then I um, uh, saw an advert in the BMJ and applied to do a research and policy fellowship looking at paediatric medication safety and in particular the use of what they would call in America computer um, physician order entry systems, but what we would call here an electronic health record. Um, and so that is how I spent a year. Um, I was lucky to get the fellowship. I went to Boston. I spent a year learning about um, computer physician. Sorry. It's all right. Computer physician order entry system. Oh. I'm so sorry. Don't worry trying to log in elsewhere please continue okay no problem um and um also because it was a mixture of research and policy starting to get intrigued by the idea of policy now i'll be honest i don't really know what the word policy meant i still find it quite a hard word to describe but essentially i spent my time in america both um reading about and doing research but i also spent time thinking about how is the healthcare system in america organized and most importantly, how does that differ from the way it is in the UK? So one piece of work that came out of my time in the States, which was around these sorts of issues, was following how a prescription happened in the States versus in the UK. And not to bore you with that, but just as an example, in the UK, we hold ward stock and children are given their medications when they're an inpatient from the ward. But in America, there's no such thing as ward stock because of the billing system. And so every time a patient needs a medication, the medication has to be pulled out of the central pharmacy, logged against that patient's records, sent to the ward, um, and then logged when it's used. And in order to do that, they were using barcoding systems. So even something as simple as, as, as um, uh, how you actually administer drugs was different between the two systems because of the billing systems, which are to do with the how, how the healthcare system functions, which is ultimately governed by health policy. So. I came back to the UK um, and restarted my training as a registrar at Barnet and Chase Farm and didn't quite know what, sorry, can we have the next slide? And didn't quite know what to do with what I had learned about in this place, which is where I had been when I was in the States. This is the Brigham and Women, um, which is part of a big hospital train in the United States um, called um, Partners, which also encompasses Massachusetts General and Boston Sick Kids and the Dana Farber, which specializes in cancer, and the Jocelyn Diabetes Center and some smaller district general hospitals. So I was pondering all these thoughts. What do I do? How do I keep my hand in doing something to do with policy, doing some research whilst I was at Barnet? Can we have the next slide, please? And then I saw an advert in the BMJ, 
um, you'll note to yourself there is a recurring theme here, which is not to become a BMA member, but it is more about looking around you and seeing what opportunities there are. Um, and the advert asked for a junior doctor to come and spend a year working at this building, which was then Richmond House, which, well, it still is Richmond House, but then it was the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, so I applied and I was very lucky that um, the opportunity was for a junior doctor to work for the then Chief Medical Officer, Celine Donaldson. Um, and it was around patient safety. And because I'd spent my year in the States doing so much work on patient safety, and it wasn't really something that most junior doctors in the UK had thought that much about 20 years ago, I was lucky enough to get that role. So I went to the Department of Health to work with Liam. And the idea was that I would work with him on patient safety related issues in the UK, um, working with an organization that existed at the time that doesn't now exist called the National Patient Safety Agency. Um, but over time, it became clear that he had another junior doctor who was there who um, was working on similar issues for the WHO, the World Health Organization. And so actually what happened over the course of the next year and beyond was that we uh, worked very closely together. And so I worked both on issues for the Department of Health, but also for WHO. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and um, just before we come to this, I'll just say one other thing about that work. So. Um, I arrived at the Department of Health just as the modernizing medical careers debacle was started, starting. So I actually ended up spending at least um, the large part of that first year um, doing various things to do with that. Um, and then um, had the opportunity to extend my time um, work for the Department of Health and the WHO. And so extended that eventually to two and a half years. Um, and um, during that time, I learned a huge amount about UK health policy and also started to think about how what goes on in the Department of Health, and this was before NHS England existed, then transfers into the rest of the system. But what I realised at the time was that I wasn't just um, using um, my skills um, that I had learned through health. I was also using skills that I'd learned in other ways. And so this picture is um, demonstrating two things. So the building on the right is where I was living at the time. It's a grade two star listed um, building uh, that houses about 50 flats. And I was in charge of the residents association and tried to look after a listed building and make sure it was safe. It had no fire safety system when I started. No sprinkler systems, no fire alarms. So trying to put all of that in to, taught me a huge amount about management. And suddenly on the left, um, I um, act as um, a governor of um, various schools. And that again taught me a huge about, about how to manage systems. But in that case, how to do it through many more professionals than on the right hand side. Can I have the next slide please? So, um, so I'm learning all these skills both within medicine and without medicine. And um, I, came to the end of two and a half years, which could have been three years, but I was given the opportunity to go and work at a management consultancy, McKinsey Healthcare, where I was supporting a piece of work which was developing healthcare consultancy. But instead of doing it for very big hospitals or um, uh, at the time they were um, um, mm, primary care trust, PCTs, um, which then morphed into CCGs, um, I uh, said these McKinsey wanted to think about how they could have a slightly cheaper offer that would be available to more organizations. So I spent six months working on that. And the benefit of doing that was that I learned some really important program management rigor. I also learned how to ask questions and answer them. Perhaps the most important thing, because there are lots of consultants who work in the healthcare system, I learned how to um, manage um, consultants um, when they come and work for you. And by manage consultants when they come and work for you, what I mean is that I learned how to get the best out of that experience because actually it can be very, very difficult to work with consultants because the um, uh, incentives don't always align um, because what a consultant wants is to keep doing lots of work and um, what you might want 
is uh, that you do one piece of work and then it is finished. So um, I came to the end of my um, three years outside of healthcare uh, and well, healthcare being training. And I um, had to think about what next. And I realized that I've learned a little bit about policy and I understood a little about clinical work and I was passionate about being a clinician and wanted to go back and finish my training. Um, and I'd taken part in a scheme which really sadly doesn't exist anymore, which paired junior doctors with senior um, managers in the NHS, in my case, the chief executive of, um, could we have the next slide, please? This hospital, which is the North Middlesex in um, uh, um, North London. And over the course of that final year of my time out of training, I had built a very good relationship with her. And I rather cheekily said to her, I'd really like to learn more about hospital management. If I can get the deanery to agree, can I come and work for you part time as a manager and do my training part time? Do it. I'm sure that she said yes, thinking that it would never happen um, because the deanery would never let me do it. But luckily for me, Hilary Cass, who some of you may know, was then the head of school for paediatrics and she agreed to let me do this. So I started back doing half my time at, um, at Barnet and Chase Farm and half my time at um, uh, the North Middlesex. And at the North Middlesex, I worked as a service manager, so running an ophthalmology service. I learned an awfully large amount about ophthalmology, much more than I ever knew um, as a medical student, as most of us had about a week's worth of ophthalmology when we were a medical student. And I did everything from um, HR, so performance managing people, to managing um, uh, budgets, um, managing outpatients, we built a new outpatients, we moved new staff in, we changed how we managed diet, uh, not diabetes, cataract, um, so that we had a one-stop shop, which required recruiting different people and different equipment. And probably the biggest piece of work was uh, working on and winning a sector-wide tender for diabetic retinal screening against private provider competition. So I learned a huge amount from that. And at the same time, if we have the next slide, I um, carried on doing some work with both WHO on patient safety and also um, with the Department of Health. So I juggled those two roles for two and a half years and then I went back to um, full-time paediatrics at Northwood Park and finished my training and then started to think about what next. Now, before I go on and um, think about the what next bit, I'll just stop there for a second and see if anyone's got any questions um, that they um, wanted to pop into the chat or ask um, about what I've said so far in terms of journeys and how that might fit with anything that they're thinking about, which is slightly out with the norm of um, a career in general paediatrics or a subspecialty of paediatrics. I'll stop for a second. Not seeing anything in the chat. I've clearly sent everyone to sleep. <laughs> Give it one. Okay, perfect. So I'll just read it in case people can't see the chat. Do you think those opportunities are available also for consultants? That is an excellent question. Um, so if we pull out the bits that I've told you about, the so doing a health policy um, uh, fellowship, absolutely. It was relatively unusual to do it as a younger person. The Harkness Fellowship, which is what I did, still exists, so absolutely. Um, the next bit of that story, going to work at the Department of Health, um, absolutely there are opportunities to do that. Every um, area of um, medicine has a national clinical director who continues to work clinically and work um, in policy. Um, so that exists. And then there are various um, other associate roles that click with that national clinical director. Um, in terms of research, yes, there are obviously fellowships that you can do both as a younger doctor and a consultant. Um, the um, bit actually working um, at the Department of Health or now NHS England um, as a trainee definitely exists. There's something called the Medical Directors Fellowship Scheme, which you can only do when you're a training. So yes, that still exists. And then the working part-time as a service manager and working part-time as a junior doctor. Um, there were various examples of that across the country. In Manchester, um, there was a program for a long time. Um, and then um, there are various opportunities that come up now and then 
for people to do that. Um, but you're right, those tend to be more when you're in training rather than when you're a consultant. I hope I answered that question. Um, yeah. Yes. Sorry, I can't see the chat box myself, but I just wondered if I could chip in with a couple of my own questions quickly. Yes, of course. I just was wondering, um, what do you do? You feel if that some of your skills as a clinician contributed to um, helped you in your role as a manager? Yeah. And then the yeah. second question was, did you see any difference uh, between the hospitals where doctors were much more involved in at the management level uh, yeah. compared to hospitals where they weren't? Yeah. Okay. So let me try and answer the first one, and then. Um, uh, you might have to remind me of the second one because I'm afraid oh. at the moment my brain is slightly addled. Um, okay, so um, the um, first one of those. Um, so I'll give you an example of why it matters. So when I first started as the ophthalmology service manager, I wanted to go and introduce myself to the clinical lead who was running the ophthalmology service. And about three times I made appointments with her secretary to meet with her and she never turned up. So I eventually... Um, sat outside her room until she returned and so forced her into having a conversation with me and she screamed at me what exactly are your credentials for managing my service now if I'd had a little bit more um, courage and if it was now I would say I'm not going to answer that question because I'm not going to be spoken to like that but instead um, why don't you test out what I can do and then see if you still want to ask me that question in a few months time but I didn't so instead I listed what I thought were useful attributes of what I could bring to the story and she sort of begrudgingly said okay and then we had quite a complicated relationship for a while until I started helping her to get stuff done and then she was really really pleased and the reason that I could do that was because in order to um, build changes in her surface, for example, starting doing macular degeneration work. What had to happen was the brilliant ideas that the clinicians had based on evidence and papers, for example, the New England Journal of Medicine, had to be translated into a story that made sense to the service and fitted yes. with the hospital's objectives. And that's not something that a pure clinician can do and that's not something that a pure manager can do. You need a mixture of both. And if that exists in one person, that makes it easier. So what we were able to do in that case was take the clinical story, which is that if you inject a drug into um, um, patients' eyes, you can save their sight. And we were able to show why it was better for the patients to do it closer to home rather than them all having to go to more fields to have it done. We were able to show how we could do this in a cost-effective way. We were able to map the pathway. We were able to show what equipment was going to be needed. We were going to be able to show how many operations we saved. So we wrote that whole business case. We got it through mm -hmm our um, executive and we got the funding for it and we started doing it and so that's how doing the two was particularly useful see now i've forgotten your second question you'll have to repeat it sorry no that's fine that sounds immensely satisfying by the way um i was just wondering if um if you'd had experience in hospitals where they didn't have clinicians oh yes uh, at the managerial level and what were the, what were the differences so i so i don't think i've worked anywhere where there haven't been clinicians who have led services. The question though is where the power sits. Okay. So in the organization I work in at the moment, it is, which is Guys and St. Thomas's and the Evelina, it is very, very, very clear mm. that the uh, responsibility sits with clinicians. We are a clinically led service. So our trust executive, when it meets, has more clinicians in the room of all flavors, nurse, doctor, therapist, than managers. And that means that if we just take this to the present day, as we were thinking about how we're going to cope with COVID, I will remember for as long as I live a meeting which had about 200 people in it. This was in February, at which the infectious disease team were laying out what the issues were likely to be in the future. And the clinicians were talking about how they were going to respond. And we realized that we were going to have to reduce the amount of outpatient work we were doing and the amount of elective work we were doing and discharge as many patients as we could safely to other places so that we could increase the throughput through the emergency department. We could open um, more um, uh, adult intensive care units. Um, we could manage the children and the adults who had to come in for other reasons safely. And we could deal with the fact that staff were likely to get sick. And I will never forget uh, the chief exec, who is actually a doctor by background, saying to the group of assorted people, 
what do you think? Is this the right policy? Stick your hands up. We, we literally voted on it. And his three questions were, should we do what we've just discussed? Should we do less or should we do more? And as we were about to take a vote, the intensive care consultant said, I don't think we're, going, we're doing enough. We need to go at this harder and faster. rather than the decrease outpatient down to almost none in two weeks or in four weeks. And so we did take a vote on it and we did decide to go harder and faster. And boy, was it lucky that we did, because otherwise we might have ended up in an Italy type situation. Right. So that is absolutely to me about what clinical leadership in the hospital context looks like, because we then worked as teams to make that happen. But the direction of travel, where we were trying to get and the pace we were trying to get there was set by clinicians. Does that answer your question? Did that absolutely. Happen? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so there is another, no problem, there is another question in chat, um, which was how did it feel working as a service manager? Um, and a second part to that, did you feel well supported in this role? So I'll be honest and say it was the hardest job I've ever done and I've done some pretty tough jobs. Um, it was the hardest job because you've got almost no authority, um, but you've got to get stuff done. So for example, we needed um, to, um, uh, change um, the, I said to you, the cataract pathway. So the way that cataracts have been paid for um, uh, previously was that every time you saw a patient, you got paid. And the way that the um, Department of Health and NHS England decided to start paying for it was a block payment. So every cataract surgery you did, you got, let's say, a thousand pounds. But suddenly what that meant was it was much better not to see patients often, but to do it as efficiently as possible, rather than under the old system, it was efficient to do it, um, at, you'd make more money, which was then available for your patients um, in terms of the services we could provide if you saw patients more often. So we had to streamline everything. We had to make it so that you came in on one day, you saw the doctor, you saw the nurse, you saw the optometrist, you got your surgical, surgical date, you got your second eye surgical date, and your post-op care was done in the community by opticians so that we could make it as streamlined as possible. And the problem was that uh, nobody likes change. And so as the poor service manager, you're running around trying to make this happen without being able to force people to do it. So you have to learn how to influence. So it was really hard, um, but I learned a huge amount. Um, did I feel well supported? As I described to you, not initially from the clinical team always because it took them a while to trust me. Um, but I was very lucky because I was a service manager in an organization where the chief executive would meet with me regularly. I always knew that I had air cover, which is a crucial, crucial thing. And most service managers don't know the chief executive and don't have that air cover. So although my life was hard, I was a do doctor doing a role that doctors don't normally do. I did have some advantages. Um, there's another question, which was... Um, how do you motivate a team who are not familiar with clinical governance structures? Any experience in that? Yes. So I think for most clinical teams, clinical governance is still seen as um, something that's a bit irritating rather than something which is there to support what they do. And so I think what's crucial when you're trying to get teams to do things differently is to always think about the incentive structure. So what is it that the team wants to do and how can you use your knowledge of the system to make that happen. So that's how I would try and align those two. Um, and um, then the second bit of uh, that question is really, it's another question, but it's similar. Um, how do you deal with other team members who are not as willing to change and improve the quality of care? That's a really, really difficult question. Um, so I think leading by example is absolutely key. Um, and that's why I remain as a clinician and as a manager, because I want people to know that I'm living what I'm preaching. So um, live what you preach, be a role model, um, be optimistic and positive no matter what. So again, I'll give you another example of something that happened. When I was at the North Middlesex, I also took on some quality improvement work on the postnatal ward. And one of the issues was that it was taking forever for families to get discharged. So what we wanted to do was do a one-stop shop where the mum would get discharged at the same time as the baby. Um, and we realised that that was quite hard to do by the bedside. So um, we took over a cupboard and there was a uh, dining room which was um, next door to the cupboard. And we thought we could use the combination of those two to manage that. And we'd have a midwife 
from the community and the pediatrician doing a clinic in the morning, discharging the relevant people on the extreme line and get them out quickly. This was all going tickety-boo and we got everything refurbished and we got all the equipment we needed and we got the HR bit sorted out. And at the last minute, um, it all fell to pieces because we had asked mothers whether they wanted to eat in the dining room or by their bedside. And they said by their bedside because they didn't want to go to the dining room because they weren't allowed to take the babies in the dining room and they obviously didn't want to leave their babies. So the dining room wasn't actually being used, so that wasn't the issue. But the problem became a health and safety one because it turned out that the mums were walking to the kitchen to pick up their lunch and take it back to their bed on trolley or on um, trays, which was fine because it had just sort of evolved, but it wasn't actually okay from a health and safety perspective. And since we were writing a new policy, we weren't allowed to write that down. So we then um, had a near disaster about three days before we were due to launch this. So I got together the group that we were working with and basically said to them, yikes, what are we going to do? And the key is to build a really good, heterogeneous, diverse team. Because on that team, I had midwives, I had nurses, I had pediatricians, young and trainees. I had as managers. I had um, all the sort of people, including some of the healthcare assistants who helped in the um, feeding of the families. And so we called this emergency meeting and said, you know, this is what are we going to do? And because we built up a really good relationship and a really good banter between everyone, the healthcare system felt able and willing to put their hands up and say, well, you could use the uh, trolley that is in a cupboard. And we said, what trolley is in a cupboard? Anyway, it turned out there had been a trolley all along that no one had ever remembered existed, but this healthcare assistant did, that was in a trolley. So she saved everyone because we then put the food into the trolley and the trolley was then wheeled round and then the mothers could stay at their bedside so everybody was happy. And we moved on and we set that up. And I don't know if any of you work in hospital sex, whether or not that is still happening. Um, or not. But the key is that you've got to have a atmosphere that is uh, able to let everybody voice their changes and I think really being a role model. So that's just two elements of how to encourage other people to engage in, in change. The thing that we've done since I've been at the Evelina is every year we hold a quality improvement conference where we highlight uh, what people have done. And when we started this uh, six years ago, um, we had about 10 or 20 posters and they weren't particularly well written. I had to spend the whole weekend rewriting them. We did a big evening event with drinks and we talked a lot about it and some people came and it was great. And over the years, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger. And this year, if it hadn't been cancelled for COVID, we would have had 150 posters. They were awesome. And we've got to the point now where we have prizes, um, we have a big speaker come, we have a big drinks reception and people really feel proud um, to be there. And in fact, this year we would have launched the what is the best idea that you stole from somewhere else because it's important not to think that you have to invent everything for new. And what is the best quality improvement um, project that's failed? Because we only ever talk about successes, but actually it's also okay to fail. It's a bit of a shame that didn't happen, but hopefully when COVID is all over, if we ever get back to any sort of normal, we will redo that. I'm going to answer one more question that's here and then we'll go back to the talk and we'll do some more at the end. So the next question that I've got in front of me is... Um, um, I do believe doctors joining the NHS from overseas need at least introductory court courses in leadership and management. Um, I think that is a very fair point. And the reason why I think that's a very fair point is that um, I now, as a clinical director, sit on a lot of um, interview panels for consultants. And when you uh, do that, you're not being judged on your clinical skills because you've had all your training signed off. Um, you are being judged on what else you can bring to the story. And it is very clear to me that people who have worked within the system absorb lots of information about how the system works and how they can get involved, whether it's doing audits or quality improvement projects or working on guidelines or doing all sorts of stuff um, or leading to more service redesigns. Um, whereas if you come from abroad, not only do you not get the opportunity to that, but you may not even be aware that that matters. Um, and so I do think that's a very valid point. There are courses that people can do, for example, the King's Fund run courses, um, but whether or not that's something that should be expanded and done uh, remotely more or done in different ways, um, I think that's a very interesting question and one to ponder on. Right, I'm going to go back to the slides. Give me one mm -hmm. second. Okay, so we were on a slide of the WHO, so can we uh, go to the next slide, please? So, um, the... Next slide is a picture of a remarkably empty looking Evelina. Um, it doesn't quite look like that now. It seems to always be full of much more stuff. So 
when I came to the end of my training, I was very, very lucky to see another advert for a job, um, which was my perfect job, which was half clinical work and half service improvement. And I applied for that job and very luckily got it and started at the Everly and uh, became involved in some local improvement work around outpatients. Um, I helped to um, develop and deliver what's called a call forward system for outpatients, which means that when you check into outpatients, you scan a barcode on your letter and that then lets the clinician in the rooms know that you're here. The clinician then clicks a button on their computer, which then gets shown on screens in the waiting room so the patient knows which room to go to. And then you can send a patient around the system. So the same thing can happen outside the bottom or x-ray or various investigations. So we helped to create that system for children. So I did lots of interesting improvement work. But I also got involved in a project, which um, can I ask you to go to the next slide, um, which is a picture, hopefully, of um, the um, uh, um, London Eye, um, uh, but also with a series of different, um, instead of having a series of different um, I guess gondolas, um, we've got a series of different words. So this is really just to remind me about the project that I got involved with seven years ago. So change doesn't have to happen within an organisation. The Children and Young People's Health Partnership has happened across the system. So if I just very briefly summarise this, because I could talk to you for about 10 hours on this alone, we've basically built an integrated care system for children. So that means that we work with local GPs in Southwark and Lambeth and with the other organisations around us. So the um, schools, the other local hospitals, so Kings and Slam, the um, various levels of GP organisations, including the primary care networks, um, and funded by the Guys and St Thomas's charity, we have built a system which proactively identifies children with certain conditions. We've chosen four conditions, asthma, epilepsy, um, eczema and constipation through the GP systems. So we've built search algorithms. And we've got all the information government signed off. So you can identify children who might have those conditions. We then send them a link to a portal, which um, the family, if they want to get involved, can download. And then um, we have separated the groups of GPs into two arms because we're running a quasi-random a quasi randomized controlled study. So half of the GPs are in the intervention arm and half of them are in the control arm. If you're in the control arm, the kids get access to the portal or the families get access to the portal, they fill it out and then they get sent to generic advice. If you're in the intervention arm, then you get access through the portal um, to a whole series of different services based on the information you fill out. So for example, with asthma, you'd answer questions about how sick you are, so you do the asthma control test, you'd answer questions about your mental health, your family's mental health, you'd answer questions about social tomography, and then if there were warning flags there that you had badly controlled asthma, you'd be um, linked into nurses and also into paediatricians and also into the relevant services in primary care um, and um, uh, SLAM, so our, our, our mental health provider, and you would get the necessary input. We're also um, in the intervention arm running a relationship where paediatricians go out and do clinics alongside GPs um, to support the GPs. So you get a souped up intervention in the intervention arm and in the control arm at the moment you don't. And we've been running this now um, uh, for a few years and our data is showing that by doing this intervention you reduce the amount of um, time that children in the intervention arm need to come to hospital either to outpatient appointments or to A&E or um, to be admitted and by doing that you save the system enough money to pay for the interventions that we are providing. So we need about another year's worth of data collection which is sadly suspended at the moment because of COVID but we'll restart shortly and hopefully we will publish that as a successful randomized controlled trial. It'll be one of the first times ever that an integrated care system in any age, let alone my children, um, has been published in this way or has been done in this way and then published and hopefully it will show um, what I've just described to you um, and so that will be amongst the first times that we have hard evidence that coordinating care properly actually saves money in the long run. So phenomenally exciting to work at scale um, across Southwark and Lambeth and the next stage for this is spreading that out to the South East London region which is another four CCGs and then thinking about how we can take the learning from that spread it to other diseases and spread it even more broadly. So that's what I've been doing in terms of taking the knowledge that I've learned as a service manager in policy um, and managing change, not just within the organization, but between organizations. Um, 
we're going to go to the next slide, if that's okay. So the next slide, I should really ask you what this is, but I would imagine that most of you know what that is. Um, that is our lovely little friend, um, COVID-19, or rather not COVID-19, the coronavirus, which causes COVID-19. Um, and I guess I just wanted to um, finish before we go on to what I've learned with um, how I've been applying some of this in my role as a clinical director to give you a flavor of what being a clinical director means. So in the Evelina, um, we have three directorates, medicine, surgery, and community. So I look after medicine, and sitting under medicine are nearly 20 services. They range from the emergency department all the way through to neurosurgery. I know, don't ask, why does neurosurgery sit under medicine? That's because neurosurgery is a tiny part of the neuroscience um, uh, service. And uh, so that service, uh, sorry, that directorate has a turnover of around 100 million pounds a year. Um, which ultimately my head is on the block for. So I support the services through their clinical leads to do the work that they do. And when things aren't working, either because people are sick or because services need to change and adapt or grow, I help them to do that in various different ways. And during COVID-19, my role has been, um, I guess, really chief conductor of the amazing orchestra that I work with. So, for example, when the decision was made to reduce the number of outpatients that we were seeing so that we could uh, use our resources differently, it was my job to work with the teams to work out how we identified the children who were not going to come to the hospital safely. If children did need to be seen, how could we do it through telephone clinics? It was my job to set up virtual clinics using software, for example, Attend Anywhere. It was my job to make sure this was a dynamic process it was my job now, as we start to reopen and do face-to-face, -to, -face, to, uh, to do that safely using all of the infection control processes that we need. Um, it's my job to see how that links into radiology, how that links into surgery. It's my job to keep people's morale up. It's my job to support those who are shielding at home. It's been my job to oversee who got redeployed, both into paediatrics, but also out of paediatrics to the adult world. It was my job to help support the um, intensive care, giving over time and uh, people to the adult um, world so that they could expand their intensive care units in the way that we've just described. And um, that's just a little example of what I do um, now in the coronavirus world. Um, but we can go in more detail into that if people have questions when we get to the questions. So, um, mindful of time, I'm just going to move on to the last slide, please. So what have I learned? Um, I think I have learned um, that I'm actually a better doctor because I understand how the system works and because of all those other experiences. That understanding how policy works means that I know how to translate things in the hospital, but even just within the general paediatric service, into reality. So when I hear policies about trying to keep children out of hospital, um, I understand how that might translate into what I actually do day to day. So, for example, it's using telephone hotlines so GPs can talk to a paediatrician, setting up systems so they can transfer videos to us so that we can see patients without them having to come to hospital. Um, I've learned that you can't do things on your own. You absolutely need a team. And part of the challenge is how you learn to manage and support a team. That um, doing lots of different things at once is really difficult, but it's enormously fun. Uh, that one of the most rewarding things that I've done and continue to do is support um, and mentor other people so that we can um, build more people who have skills to do different things. So I told you that I went to work at the Department of Health um, with another doctor. By the time he and I left, we'd grown that scheme from two doctors to 15. And uh, the Medical Directors Fellowship Scheme, which grew out of that scheme, now has, I think, about 30 doctors a year. Um, so that's just an example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, that I never expect to be a full-time clinician. Um, at the moment, I do about two-thirds clinical and one-third management, but I think probably shortly that's going to move to a third clinical, a third pure management, and a third um, uh, um, yet more improvement work. Um, and then finally, um, and this is probably a sort of tantalizing one, I do genuinely believe that what I love doing is medical management, so making things different, changing things. But in order to do that, you do have to lead by example. But the two are not necessarily the same. And there are some roles that are all about leadership and not about management. And if that's your thing, that's absolutely fine. But you do have to identify 
which one of those you are. So I'll stop for a second and let me just go back to the chat um, and see if people have questions um, uh, or, um, oh, and I'm not in the right bit, right, see if people have questions um, about uh, that. Okay, so I'm seeing a question already. How do you protect time for your ongoing development uh, to gain skills you need to continue in leadership roles? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think be brave. So here's the thing I've learned. If you go to someone with a plan and say, I really want this and this, and this is how I'm going to do this and this. So for example, in my case, it was, I went to Hillary and I went to the chief executive of the North Middlesex at the time and said, I want to be a service manager. I want to be a part-time registrar. This is how I'm going to make it work. This is what I need from you. To be honest, they were so flabbergasted, couldn't quite come up with a way or a reason to say no. So I think it's absolutely possible, but you've got to do the hard work if you want to do something differently. The second part of that question was, and how do you safeguard leading, getting the best outcomes and not micromanaging? Yes, very good. Um, that is one of the challenges. So I think, what does it mean to lead? It means that you want stuff to get done. And I think you end up micromanaging if you haven't built in systems, which go back to the earlier question about governance, that can assure you that things are happening. So one way I find to do that is, for example, with a service, let's take the respiratory service. If I just left them to their own devices, um, what might happen is that they were all sitting there doing nothing and there were loads of cases of children who needed bronchoscopies who weren't getting them, who were getting into serious trouble. So what we set up is a very regimented once a month check-in where we look at all the data and where we have a clear action plan, we put against it who's going to do what and when they're going to report back. So that's a way for me to check in to assure myself that things are happening, but I'm not micromanaging, or it doesn't feel like I'm micromanaging because we've got a regular thing set up. So I hope that answers that question. If not, um, ping, ping another chat and I'll try again and explain it better. Um, the next question, a lot of the work you mentioned included technology. What expertise did you need to develop to be able to do that? Yeah, great question. So there are schemes at the moment that can help people develop and become what's called clinical information officers. Um, and they're run through NHS England and you can definitely do that. Um, I didn't do a formal scheme like that, but I did do further management um, uh, studies um, to help me. Um, but I think it really depends. Um, I think it really depends what you want to do. So I would not describe myself as someone who is an amazing technologist. I'm much better at the organizing bit behind the technology. Um, so I have to rely on other people who have the expertise um, to do that. Um, there's another question here about um, what do you mean by micromanaging? So I guess micromanaging is that really annoying thing where it's a bit like what your parent does to you. Um, instead of saying to someone, um, here's a problem, work out how you would fix it. The parent might say to you, I'm trying to think of, instead of the parent saying to you, hmm, I see your room growing up is a complete mess. Um, how are we going to solve the problem of keeping it tidy? And then letting you come up with ways and then checking back in now and then and saying, that's great, your room's really tidy or your room's not. Micromanaging in that context would be checking in every day saying, I found one sock on the floor today. Yesterday I found 10 socks please could you put this sock in this place and please could you put that item in that place? Do you see the difference between giving someone responsibility versus giving them tasks is really what I'm describing. I hope that helps. Um, I'm mindful of the time and I know that um, people have a hard stop at one o'clock. So I guess I just want to think about finishing, but if there are more questions, just keep putting them in the chat and I'll, and I'll divert from my kind of summary. I absolutely adore what I do. Um, I love the clinical interaction with families, but I also absolutely adore the fact that this morning I have gone from having a conversation about how to manage respiratory services um, whilst quite a lot of people are shielded at home to having a conversation um, about uh, how we can go to our charity for some grants to support some really exciting at home uh, testing kits, both for uh, sleep studies at home but also for doing blood tests at home and also doing um, EEGs at home and all sorts of other things like that. Um, in a minute I'm going to disappear and join a meeting about how we finance that then I'm going to go back to another meeting about the Children and Young People's Health Partnership that we just talked about um, then I'm going to have a meeting about how we configure the hospital and then I'm going to have a tactical meeting about coronavirus. I absolutely love that variety and I really would encourage people 
that. It's great that we have people who want to do research. It's great we have people who want to do education, but it's also exciting and useful to have people who want to manage. So I would really encourage you to do this. Um, I'm seeing a question about having a coach. Um, excellent question. I have at times had a coach. Um, I would absolutely recommend people to do that. It's brilliant to have someone to bounce things off. There are lots of opportunities both through the deanery um, but also through hospitals to get coaches. Um, and um, I would jump all of those opportunities. You may or may not click with the individual, but um, uh, keep trying until you do and use every resource you can. I'm also seeing about a question about when you were role switching, how did you develop your confidence? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just thought I'll give this a try. And I had a good enough relationship with people who were letting me do it that I didn't feel scared to do it in the same way that if I look back now on the learning experience as a junior doctor um, and think about some of the things, particularly when I was doing adult medicine, I was left to do. How come I didn't feel terrified all the time? And that's because I think I felt that the people around me were there to catch my mistakes and they had my back. And so I think the key to this is finding an environment in which you feel safe to try um, and do it with people who you feel safe to do that with. And the final question, I think that's a perfect place for me to stop, um, is do I recommend any online resources? So I would definitely um, look at resources um, on the King's Fund, on the Nuffield Trust website. I would look at the Faculty of Medical Leadership and um, Management. Um, I would look at um, uh, um, other hospital websites which are often really insightful places like the Mayo um, Clinic um, or um, uh, oh, I'm having a mental black um, that's the other big healthcare system so partners um, but there's another one in the states that come to me um, a, a book that I so books that have really helped me are actually not necessarily books about hospital management. Um, I find it quite useful to read generally about management. So flicking through something like the Harvard Business um, Review, you don't have to read every article, just read some of the um, summaries. Um, or reading books that just make you think, um, like Apple Gawande's books. Um, there is another great book by Jerry Groupman, um, How Doctors Think. Um, and um, I think, that places like the New Yorker, which often delve into um, some of these issues are quite useful because they're quite lighthearted. And then I would really recommend listening to um, various podcasts, um, which get into these sorts of issues, again, sometimes on a more um, general management um, principle basis. But um, uh, I find thinking about some of the general management principles are quite helpful then to bring back to healthcare. So as an example, um, there was some thinking about how you financially incentivize people in other industries. And then I was thinking um, about how I could adapt that or how it was already adapted within the financial world. And um, there's also something called BMJ Leader, which mm. uh, looks at some of this. Um, and uh, other things like Risky Business, which is an opportunity um, uh, for clinicians to think about patient safety and management are also really great opportunities. So I'll stop there because I think that lets us that's those people have to disappear on the hour, disappear, and say thank you. Excuse me. Hiccups. And if you want to um, get in contact with me, feel free and um, just Google me. My email at the Evelina should be on the Evelina website. Just ping me an email. I'm very happy to help in any way that is useful. Claire, thank you so much. I know you have to run. Absolute pleasure. Um, uh, I just learn so much more every time I, I hear you speak, to be honest. Um, so I think you said everything, and I've just put the links in again for the feedback and the learning pack, which also has some links, um, some resources. Okay, thanks, everybody. Take care. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you so much for organising. Bye for now. Thank you.